When it comes to Neil, his very first book, The Book of Awesome, was based off his original blog, A Thousand Awesome Things, which had and scored well over 50 million hits and was actually awarded by the Webby Awards Best Blog in the World, not once, but twice. Neil is a Harvard MBA. In addition to that, he's one of the most popular TED speakers on the planet. And he recently left Walmart, where he was actually leading their leadership development for about a decade or more. In addition to that, Neil has spoken to hundreds and thousands of people all over the world. And his work has been seen everywhere from CNN to BBC, the Oprah Winfrey Network, the Today Show, Forbes, Fast Company, the list goes on and on, and we couldn't be more excited to have him here with us today at LinkedIn, where he'll be sharing his lessons on the happiness equation, which when it hit stands back in March, went straight to number one international bestsellers list. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and give a warm LinkedIn welcome to the amazing Neil Pasricha. Thank right, you. Neil, welcome, welcome Thanks, to LinkedIn. Thanks. Are we pumped to have him or what? Thanks for having yes. me. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I warned you, but in famous tradition, we yeah. have a famous tradition, as everybody knows, here at LinkedIn, where any guest speaker, any new hire, anybody oh, right. who's new to the community <laughs> has to do two things. Are okay. you ready? Yeah. Tell us something about you not on your LinkedIn profile, and if you have it, tell us about a special talent. <laughs> I like the if you had it. <laughs> if you have one. Um, okay, what's well, not on my LinkedIn profile? It, you know, I think uh, when I think about it, it's really the gigantic vast amounts of failure I've had because okay. um, you just read a really nice bio but what you didn't include are the restaurants I started that failed the books I've written that are no longer in print the things I tried to do that I didn't get into you know and there's just so, so many of those things we all have lots of those things but like you know that's why my LinkedIn profile is like four lines because it's like there's but they're four great they're lines. four good lines but like the, the sort of like 48 bad lines are just not on there um, so yeah. Stepping stones. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't, I, I, I didn't highlight them as, as, as strongly. They're Leading not bold. Leading with your strengths. It's yeah, good. exactly. Good and then, what is a special talent that you have, Neil? Yeah, the special talent. That one's tougher. Um, but uh, my wife always tells me I'm really good at knowing what time it is, okay. without looking at a clock. And if you look around the room, there are no clocks here. Shall we quiz him? But I, I would think it's, I think it's around. Am I right in saying 2:06? Ah, yeah, yeah, that's okay. You know, uh, they're, that, that the, the, the thing you're checking is that's off. Yeah, that's, that's off a little bit. Yeah. Excellent. Well, fantastic. Another huge shout out to one of our amazing employees in the Toronto office who actually heard Neil speak yes. and was so inspired that he actually connected us to bring him into our office today. So again, Neil, thank you for being here. Get ready to be inspired and informed. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give one more big welcome to Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, got Thank you so much to Noelle and to everybody here who's putting all of this on together. There are so many people that you guys work with that do such a great job to make these things happen, and I so appreciate that. Um, I feel really lucky to be here. This is a really cool company and a really cool, I mean, like, you know, I was looking out the window, I'm like, where are we? And then I realized that I used the Empire State <laughs> Building to find where I am in New York, so I can't find it. I'm in it. I'm in it. Um, thank you so much. It's, it's kind of unnerving hearing a big, long biography of yourself like that. Um, and you know, what it makes you think of really is, is your family because they're not, men they're not mentioned, right? Like I'm married. My wife's name is Leslie. I have two little boys. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you know, I don't know how many people here are married. Uh, yeah, like, 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 yeah, like 10% of people. Okay, well, for those 10%, you know, you know, like, we fell in love, as you do. You fall in love, and then, you know, we moved in together, and then we got engaged, and then um, we got married. That's how, that's how you do it. That's actually the steps, in order for me, anyway. Um, sometimes they're reversed. And then, so, Leslie was planning the wedding. Really, that's, that was, she, I noticed she was really doing most of it. Like she would say, do you like this, do you like that? But I was like, yes, yes, yes. So I was like, why don't I plan the honeymoon? I had this great idea, I'll plan the honeymoon. And um, she wouldn't know where we're going till we got on the plane, okay? I said, you have one carry-on bag total. And we, I surprised her with a trip to Southeast Asia, which neither of us had ever been to, but it was always a dream, and we went. So we go to Southeast Asia. We've never been there before, you know, soak up the beaches, the sun, the sand, whatever. And we're leaving now to come home. Home for me is in Toronto, Canada. And we're leaving to come home, long trip, and she's not feeling well. She's not feeling, which is not good on any plane, you know, in general, especially not one where you're about to go on like a 12-hour leg. So we get off in Malaysia where we had the layover. She's really not feeling well. 
And uh, she's like, I need to sit down. I need to find a place to lie down. I need to find a pharmacy. And we get back on the plane. And now we're about to go for 12 hours, 12 hours kind of home. And, you know, we zoom up into the air above the clouds, 50,000 feet above sea level. She goes to the little airplane bathroom, you know, the tiny bathroom. She comes back to her seats and she says, I'm pregnant. It's funny to you, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know what? We were like, whoa, what? She bought the pregnancy test in, Malay like in the airport layover. And she did it. She did the pregnancy test in the airplane bathroom on the plane. Um, this is so funny to you, but this for us, it was like, no, this is not funny. I was like, whoa, like, this is like life's about to change. And so I asked a second ago, how many people here are parents? Yeah, show of hands just so I know, okay. And how many people here want their kids to be happy? Everyone, including people that aren't parents, right? That's the amazing thing. We all want our kids to be happy. If you're thinking about having kids, you're like, well, I want my kids to be happy. That's what she said to me. She's like, I just want my kids to be happy. And you know what I said on the plane, which I don't recommend? I said, uh, that's not possible. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you can't just make a kid happy. I know lots of unhappy people. You think their parents want them to be that way? You can't control happiness. Certainly not someone else's. Never mind your own. You don't get to pick it. People that have two kids, like one's happy, one's not. You know, You don't just get to make your kids happy. And she's like, we're flying home from our honeymoon. You know, this is not romantic. Uh, but I was like, no, I'm serious about this thing. So we land at home in Toronto. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to look into this. I'm going to research this. I spend the nine months of her pregnancy going deep into positive psychology. There are 300 positive psychology studies I could find. Read every single one. Don't recommend doing that. I did my own research. I did tons of interviews. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to crack this nut. Happiness, this weird word, nebulous like love or joy or sorrow. What does it even mean? I want to figure it out. I wanted to go deep. So I ended up writing a 300-page letter to my unborn child on how to live a happy life. So yeah, I did. Like I wrote this huge letter, which has just been published as the happiness equation, the book you guys are all holding in LinkedIn offices around the world right now. Um, that's the letter I wrote after all that research and looking into it and everything I could find. And I got to tell you, I learned a lot about happiness. So you know what they said? They said, hey, could you come in and talk for like half an hour? I'm like, yeah. So let me try to give you like the half an hour kind of nugget of what I found. The book has got nine secrets to happiness in it. I'm going to share with you today the very first one. Okay. So the movie version of the start of the book. But before I do, like, like I said, happiness is like nebulous, right? Like, what does it even mean? It's like love. It's like wisdom. It's like vague. So um, that's partly why I had that reaction on the plane. I'm like, what is it? You can't even be, you know, happy. So I, I checked, you know, I went online and I was like, okay, you know this game where you type the first half of something and then you see what comes, right? You do it with your name sometimes or whatever, right? So then it's like how to be, um, the first drop down is happy. We want this more than we want to be rich, pretty, or a real estate agent, <laughs> which is amazing. I did not doctor this slide. This is a real screenshot. We want to be rich. We want to be pretty. Apparently, we want to get into the real estate game. Uh, but we want to be happy more than anything else. Okay. So we want to be, and you know, there are exit surveys now at colleges and universities showing that students want happiness more than wealth for the first time time. For those of you who have children that are college, university age, you know, they're saying, I just want to be happy. You know, I don't really, you know, I don't necessarily want or need to make the most money. I want to be happy. We're looking for that more. Okay. So what have we done about it? What have we as a people done about this desire we have? We've created like an elephant sized industry. If you go on Amazon and you type in happiness into the books department, you get over a hundred and five thousand books like on ha just on happiness so are you gonna like are you gonna read these like there's too many it's like a haystack there's too many things to we've made this industry because we're looking for it like i said we want it more than anything else we're looking for it we made an industry so 
you're probably wondering, so are we there yet? Like, are we happy? Is it working? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Professor David Myers at the University of Michigan has been studying happiness in the largest longitudinal study out there since 1955. A lot of things have changed from 1955 to today. Um, our wealth has changed. It's a hockey stick curve. We're a lot richer now than we used to be, um, even on relative terms. Okay, we're a lot richer now than we used to be. Our safety has increased exponentially. Murder rates around the world are now six per 100,000 people, which is the lowest it's ever been in our species history. So we're safer than ever. We're safer than ever. Technology, mobility, accessibility, you know all these things have skyrocketed, but our happiness has stayed flat. We haven't moved the needle, okay? Sometimes if I'm doing a workshop or whatever, we talk about like, why is this? We're a lot richer, we have more safety, we have more technology, but we're not any more happy. Yet according to Aristotle, you know, it's the, it's the ultimate aim of life. According to the Declaration of Independence, it's, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit, not achievement, apparently. Pursuing, we're looking for it. So where do we find this? How do we find this? Well, that's why I wrote this book, because I was trying to say, if anything ever happened to me, you know, it turned out to be a boy, we didn't know, so it's my, my son. If anything happens to me and, like, you know, my son's like, you know, what's dad's advice? Like, this is everything I've got. This is everything I could figure out. This is everything I could summarize. And I put it all into a few points, into a few points, okay? So here's the thing. How many people here are, you know, their parents are immigrants or their grandparents are immigrants? How many show of hands? A lot of hands. You know, my parents are too. My mom's from Nairobi, Kenya. My dad's from uh, New Delhi, India. They came to North America in the 60s, and they, like, hammered something into my head when I was a kid. I'm going to tell you what the, it was. They said, Neil, if you do great work, okay, if you do great work, then you will have a big success, okay? This is like the immigrant mantra. This, <laughs> and then you will be happy, okay? For example, if you study really hard, you will get straight A's, and if you're East Indian, you'll become a doctor, <laughs> okay? I didn't do that, but if you work really hard, you'll get promoted, you're happy. Sound familiar? We hear this from our parents. If we're parents, we kind of tell it to our kids, to work hard, come on, you want to get into a good school, it's real important, okay? But the way I now draw this model is completely backwards, completely backwards. Instead, what I say is, based on all the research, instead, if you be happy first, if you be happy first, then you do great work. You're happier doing it. According to the cover of Harvard Business Review, you're 31% more productive. You have 37% higher sales. You are three times more creative than your peers. We like working with those happy people. Turns out they do great work. They're happier. And then you have the big success. The big success comes later. Comes later. It's the exact opposite of how we think about it. What kind of success? Two kinds. Career success. Studies show that people that are happier or have a positive mindset at work are 40% more likely to get a promotion in the next 12 months. So if you are like ramped up on career, great. This is a good thing for you. You will be more likely to be promoted. But I like to think of it holistically too. How about just life? How about just like, how do you measure life success? One way is longevity. How long do you last here? And you know, um, the average person in uh, the States lasts 30,000 days. That's what we got. That works out to our whole life uh, in days terms. Um, around the world, by the way, it's 25,000. So we're, you know, by being in this country, you already have a 5,000 day bump, about 15 years. And then if you're happy, you get an extra 3,000 days, an extra 10 years of life. Some of you, because I know this is like a data-oriented crowd. You're like, well, how do you know that? Well, here's how you know it. Because at the University of Kentucky a few years ago, they found a whole bunch of handwritten autobiographies written by every nun who joined every U.S. convent in the 1930s. 
some of your faces are like, who cares? That's not a big deal. Um, but the thing is, these researchers realize something that I would never have figured out, which is that nuns, it turns out, are the perfect people to study. You see, every single variable in their life is controlled. They're the same gender, they wear the same clothes, they eat the same food, they live in the same place. None of them smoke or drink or have sex ever. Last time I said that, a woman yelled out, not the nuns I know, <laughs> which is like a, that's not on the LinkedIn speaker series, though. That's a different speech. So, like, they looked at these autobiographies. They split them into piles. They said, okay, there's, like, normal nuns. You know, went to school at Notre Dame, graduated in 1909, joined the mother house. Then there was happy nuns using a vocabulary analysis. They looked for phrases, like, I'm looking forward with eager joy, or I've had a blessed life knowing nothing else about them, just the, just the words they use. And then because the study was done after the year 2000, so a long time after they wrote those bio autobiographies, you could find out what happened to the nuns. And the happier group lived 10 years longer. They used age 95 as a benchmark. 15% of us on average make it to that age. 55% of the happy group hit the age of 95. Be happy first. Then the good work comes later. And then the big success follows. Career success and life success. So, look, I know everyone's busy and I, like a big hello because we've got offices like around the world dialing in here. So there's people in Silicon Valley, there's people in Omaha, there's people in, where else? I was going to say, I don't know the time changes around the world. I'm good at like knowing the time where I am. Mm. And so when you go back to work, um, you know, and somebody says, so what'd you learn from that like happy guy? Because you went to see that happiness guy. So what'd he teach you? What I don't want you to say is, well, he wrote be happy on a chart and then he circled it. <laughs> that's not a very good magic trick. You know, it's like, that's just like motivation. I want to tell you like why this is important to me. But what I want to give you guys today before we do the Q&A is I want to give you application. Okay, I don't want to just give you motivation. I want to give you application. What I want to do on this flip chart is actually say, okay, why did I comb through all these studies? Because I wanted to give you the big five of them. I'm going to write down on this page what I call the big five super studies. The five things anyone can do to turn your brain into a positive focus. And when I say anyone can do these five, I mean you just pick one. You don't have to do five, you just pick one. Any of these exercises takes just 20 minutes to do. And if you do it for 20 days in a row, that's what I call the 20 for 20 challenge. 20 minutes a day, you pick one. For 20 days in a row, you've developed a new happiness habit. So we're gonna call this the 20 for 20 challenge. And I'm gonna give you the five big super studies, five things anyone can do to flip your brain around. So. Number one, three 20 minute brisk nature walks. According to um, a team at Penn State University uh, and some research done by Professor Michael Babiak, published in the American Psychosomatic Society, if you take three brisk 20 minute nature walks a week, you are happier than a test group on antidepressants and most interestingly, a test group doing both the walking and taking the antidepressants. <laughs> Just the walks alone outperform the other two groups. Does anyone here have a dog? We're in New York, it's freezing in the winter, right? So you go outside at 11 o'clock at night to walk your dog, you're probably thinking, why do I have a dog? Why, this is a terrible idea. But then when you get back to your apartment or your house or whatever, and you know, you've gone around the block, how do you feel then? You are reinvigorated, right? You're, you're like stomping your boots, getting the slush off there, you're stripping off the hat and the scarf, and your partner's probably sitting there like, what happened to you? But you've got energized from that. You get energized from that. Now there's, there's a couple interesting words I used here that I wanna highlight. One is brisk, okay? You're in New York. There's like no other way to walk. Um, and then, but this is, this is the interesting one. The other one is nature. Nature. That's a tougher one. Um, but here's why. The studies show that a walk through a forest is better than a mall. Okay? In its extreme. 
So we don't know why. The research is inconclusive. You can make your own assumption, whether that's the fresh air or the movement of the trees or whatever. But the idea is that it's through nature. Three brisk 20-minute nature walks a week. These only take 20 minutes. Number two, the 20-minute replay. The 20-minute replay. There was a famous study done at the University of Texas called How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Words. And I'm quoting some of these studies so that, you know, those of you that are really interested in the data can look it up. How do I love thee? Let me count the words. They found that if you journaled, journaled for 20 minutes about one positive experience you had during the day, then that's a good thing to do. Because what you do is you teach your brain to focus on the positive thing that happened and you replay it. You don't have a GPS signal in your head. So when you're writing it down, you know, someone bought me a coffee and I felt great and I think we're becoming friends, whatever. You're like, you're like, you know what? You're there again. You're reliving that moment. If you read your own journal, you replay it a third time. You replay it in your head a third time. They've even done this study on journaling. Uh, they've done it two ways. At University of Texas, they found that people that journaled for uh, three weeks were 50% more likely to stay together in their boyfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend relationships after three months, after three months, which was a super long relationship at University of Texas campus, <laughs> uh, apparently. Uh, but you know, it's a long relationship. It's 50% uh, campus relationship joke. Hey, we've all been there. And then, um, uh, they also have done this study on people with chronic neuromuscular pain. And if they can journal for 10 weeks, which is an admittedly long time, but say you can journal for 10 weeks, you can lower their pain medication by 50%. By 50%. Journaling, replaying it by writing it down. I got to say, I hear this study. My first thing is like, seriously, journaling? Like I used to walk into the Barnes & Noble bookstore and I was like, Who's buying this stuff? It's the first thing you see at the front door. I guess because my parents are East Indian, I was like too cheap to think. I was like, this is just blank paper stapled together with a picture of a cat on the front. <laughs> How do they charge 20 bucks for this? But then I had like this moment of truth, right? Where my publisher called me and she was like, hey, do you want to do the Journal of Awesome? It's like cognitive dissonance. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you know the Book of Awesome? Yeah, my book. She's like, how about the journal? We'll just take the logo and put it on a bunch of blank paper and staple it together. I was like, oh no, what do I gotta do? I hate these journals. But then I'm like, well, I'm not stupid. Let's do it. Okay, let's see what happens. Well, why am I telling you this story? Because this journal of awesome has outsold most of my books. As an author whose business is writing, uh, it's disheartening. The, the book I've written with no words in it has outsold the books I've spent years filling with words. Okay. <laughs> Not on my LinkedIn profile. Okay. Journaling. <laughs> Journaling. Repeating it in your head and then repeating it again when you read it. By the way, studies also show if you commit to the practice in a meaningful way, whether that means, you know, you buy the book or you have a nice pen or a certain place, whatever, that actually creates a habit, so therefore you're more likely to do it rather than if you just write it down wherever, having a place or an app or wherever helps. Cool, that's two. Number three, number three is five conscious acts of kindness. Five conscious acts of kindness. Sometimes people call this random acts of kindness, but I'm like, it's not random. If you know you're doing it. So conscious, conscious acts. Professor Sonia Lubomirsky at Stanford University did the study. And of all the five I'm sharing with you today, by the way, this one has the greatest delta on happiness. So if you're like one of those people that's like, you know, keener, I'm like, I can do any of these. Well, then this is the one to pick because actually it increases your happiness more than anything else. More than anything else. I'll tell you, I, I got into a hotel in New York one in the morning, okay, last night. I'm here really late. And um, when I get there, um, I want to drink water because I have come off a plane. So I look in the room and there's no water. There's no bottle of water. So that's fine. I don't need to drink a bottle, but I, I called the zero and I was like, hey, can you bring me a bottle of water? And they're like, oh, you got to call in-room dining. It's like, in-room dining? Okay. Put me through. Hi, can I have a bottle of water? They're like, yeah, but the wait's an hour because there's like a lineup of people eating. I'm like, this is the city of never sleep, not the city that always eats, but whatever. <laughs> I got to wait an hour, but it's one in the morning. You know what I mean? I don't want to wait an hour to have a drink. So I was like, forget it. I go to sleep. 
the next morning, today, I get up, I order breakfast. Um, guy comes to deliver it for me, guy named Bernie, Alabama. He's from Alabama. I, I, I ordered a bottle of water with my breakfast. I told him this funny story. I'm like, hey, it's hard to get a drink around here. And you know what he says? He's like, I'm sorry that happened. It's too bad. I was like, nah, no worries. See you later. Two minutes later, there's a knock on my door. Knock, knock, knock. Guess who? It's Bernie. He's got an ice bucket full of bottles of water. That's what I thought. And you know what I thought too? Because of the, my research brain? You know what I mean? Because you know what I thought too after he left? I was like, he feels even better than me. Because that's the thing it shows. When you commit the act of kindness, when you do the conscious act, you're the one that feels good. Because of our egos, right? Because we feel good about ourselves. I'm the guy that brings that water. I'm the person that holds the door when we're all leaving. I'm the lunch-making spouse or the flower-buying boyfriend. Whatever it is, you feel good about it. And it doesn't have to cost money, like the water or the flowers. It could be a three-sentence email, literally. Like, hey, old boss, you know that thing you taught me to do in meetings two years ago? I'm still doing it. Thanks. That's it. You feel good for the whole day after that. Five conscious acts of kindness. Okay, number four, meditation, meditation, big word. How many people here uh, have ever heard that meditation's good? Everyone, you guys are tapped in. You know what? Dr. Oz told me that, like 1997, right? No, but seriously, but then how many people here have a devout daily meditation practice that they're proud to share? An awesome person at the back, one guy, one person. Okay, you know what? Here's the thing. I, I make those two points. I make a point out of that because here's why. Because that was me. I'm like, I always wanted to meditate. I knew it was good for you. And then people are like, so you do it? I'm like, no, I don't do it. I just know it's good. <laughs> um, isn't that half the battle? You know what I mean? And, uh, and, and peop, you know, Leslie comes home one day uh, and she says, hey, you know how you're always talking about meditating? I'm like, yeah. She's like, but you don't do it. I'm like, that's true. You got me. She's like, now there's an app for that. You just, you just do this app. And so it was Headspace. And um, we got a little uh, cell phone like splitter. And we put the baby, because it's like if after the 10 free meditations, you got to sign up for like three bucks. So I don't want to get it on two phones. That's like six bucks. <laughs> so, so we got a little splitter. I amortize the splitter, you see? I'm just kidding. And then we get the splitter, and then we do the headspace meditation before we go to sleep. And for those of you who haven't done it, and by the way, I have no affiliation with headspace. I just highly recommend it because it's what I use. Um, it's just this guy named Andy, right? He just talks to you. He's like, so you had a long day? And I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> and then he's like, have a seat on the couch. Have a seat on the couch. Take a deep breath. Take another one. And like 10 minutes later, you're done. You just did it. You just did the thing you could never do, which was meditate. And if you don't like Headspace, I got two other ones for you. One's called 10% Happier, named after a great book written by Dan Harris about meditation, a book I also recommend, and uh, calm.com, C-A-L-M.com, which is great on a desktop too because you can just have a picture of a lake while you're on like a conference call. It's awesome. Um, but I give you a few different options so that you could pick the one that works for you. But meditation, according to Massachusetts General Hospital, increases the activity in the prefrontal cortex of your brain after just a few minutes. So that's the part of your brain responsible for focus and attention. You go from throwing grenades in the trenches of your life to being like the general of the army. You see your problems, but they're at a distance now, which is why I do it before bed, because it helps me sleep better. I don't have to think about things right before I sleep. Cool, meditation. And the last one, drum roll please, is five gratitudes. This is the one I was doing for years on my blog, 1000awesomethings.com, which I never realized. It's, it's, it's the, the study shows that if you just write down five things you're grateful for at the end of each week, you're happier. They compared it to test groups that were writing down hassles and test groups writing down events. So if you write down five gratitudes, Guess what? You're probably not surprised to hear by now. You get a lot happier. It's a good thing to do. And um, last time I gave a speech, like a woman put up her hand and she said, I don't know if I'm doing that at my house, but can I, can I tell you what I do? And you can tell me if it's the study. So I said, sure. 
She said, well, I'm married to a husband who's a bit of a grouch, and I got three teenage boys. So every night at the dinner table, it's like a yelling disaster, right? Like it's just like a ton of noise and stuff. So that's usually when every night I like slam my fist on the dinner table and like the, the fork goes flying onto the floor and I say, stop, stop intervention. I want everyone to go around the table right now and tell me one good thing about your day. After two minutes, we feel so much better. The mood completely flips. It actually totally works. Is that what the study says? And so I say, no, that's not what the study says at all. Weren't you listening to me? This is five gratitudes a week. If you're doing five gratitudes a day at your dinner table, that's 35 a week. That's a 700% increase on the minimum effective dose. My point is, it's easy. It's just five gratitudes. It's not that many. And if you want to make it even easier, I'll give you another game. Leslie and I sometimes play before we turn off the lights. It's called Rose, Rose, Thorn, Bud. She says a rose from her day, a gratitude. I say one back. She says another rose from her day. I say one back. She says a thorn, something that didn't go well, because it's important to be heard. Passion in relationships is key, right? And then a bud, which is something she's looking forward to. Rose, rose, thorn, bud. And as long as the thorn doesn't turn into like a 45 minute argument, <laughs> then you got a two minute exercise with you got four gratitudes in there. So what I'm saying is you only have to play that like two, three times a week. You already got this filled. These are the five big super studies. You can do any of these five, not all of them, just pick one. If you can commit to doing it for 20 minutes a day, for 20 days in a row, for 20 days in a row, you've developed a new happiness habit. You've got it in your life. You've chosen to be happy first, move it to the front, and you've got a specific tool you can use to get there. So look, guys, you invited me to come. I'm so happy to be here. And the way we thought we'd use this time was like, hey, Neil, can you tell us like a, a thing from the book? So this is the first chapter. You can now start at chapter two in your book when you read it, if you read it. Um, and um, we also wanted to use time for you guys. There's people from all over the world watching, and we really want to take questions from this room, but also from people from all over. So I'm just going to check the time. How are we? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. Um, Noel, for those that didn't hear, said, hey, we've got about 10 minutes, and then we're going to do Q&A. So I'm going to tell you one last story to kind of close things off about happiness. When you do this, when you take the initiative to invest in your happiness, I'll tell you what happens. First off, I really do feel your life gets a bit better, okay? All those tests I showed you about productivity increasing, creativity increasing, sales increasing, longevity increasing, promotability increasing, you'll notice that, okay? This is key. You can't afford not to do it. But then you end up bumping into your fears. It's the next thing that you face is your fears. The big project you want to give like unsolicited to your, the boss for like this thing you've been dreaming about doing or the marathon you want to run or the novel you want to write. You make time. You're feeling good. So now you kind of hit those fears. You're like, I got to, now I kind of come face to face with them. I can't just put them off anymore. And we all have fears. We all have fears. I have fears. For 30 plus years of my life, my biggest fear, I'll tell you, was actually swimming. Swimming. I won't ask if anyone else in this room shares that fear with me, but like I had ear infections my whole childhood. My whole childhood. So I had tubes in my ears my whole childhood. So I never learned how to swim. I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I could do it. So I didn't want to do it. So I didn't do it. I didn't do it. We're gonna, I see some people that kind of take pictures and stuff. We're going to leave all this up here for you. But I, what I'm trying to say is I, you know, that's, the, that's the circle we all go on with our fears. If you don't think you can do it, then you don't have the capability. And then you don't have the motivation, which is what I call want to do. So then you don't get to action, which is do. Here's me swimming. I can't do it, and I don't want to anyway, so I never get to. I'm like, I live in Toronto. I don't need to cross any bodies of water to work. Like, I'm good. I don't even own a bathing suit. People had a pool party. I hung out at the barbecue. 
and people wanted to go swimming in college, I was like, I'll go on the treadmill. I don't need to swim. Forget it. I ruled it out of my life. That's kind of what we do with our fears. It's like just eliminate it. We kind of push it away. But then, since I mentioned her a couple times already, I went out on my second date with Leslie. Remember I started with the getting married honeymoon story? Well, here we're on date number two. This is like a pre prequel, okay? We're on date number two, and over dinner that night, I already liked her on date number two. She says to me, so do you like swimming? <laughs> I was like, uh-oh. Uh, not really. Kind of just didn't want to tell her I couldn't swim. I was like, let's just let this go. I don't want to talk about this. She's like, this is what she says. No. <laughs> swimming is my favorite thing to do in the world. <laughs> you see, my family has had a cottage for generations on an island on an island, an actual, like, surrounded by water. She's like, every morning in the summer, the 20 of us, my 80-year-old grandparents, my 5-year-old cousins, we jump into the water, and we like lake, and we swim around the island. And then she says, I guess you just can't come. Again, funny to you. I wasn't laughing, but you know what I did? That night, that night, without thinking about whether I could do it, or whether I wanted to do it, I just did it. I like went home and signed up for adult learn to swim classes, <laughs> like eight sessions for 40 bucks at the downtown urban like city pool, risky for several reasons. And then <laughs> that Tuesday night, I go out on the pool deck. I'm wearing my life jacket and my goggles. Notice I said I was wearing my goggles. I did not have them on my forehead. I like had them over my eyes in case like water jumped up into my eyes. And I walk on the pool deck and you know who's waiting for me there? Guess who's at the pool deck? 10 people who suck at swimming, right? Like they can't, they're from landlocked countries. You know what I mean? Uh, trust formed quickly. And the teacher, she says, hey, keep your life jackets on, you know, keep your goggles on, and I'll give you a flutter board, okay? And you just have to get into the shallow end which is up to my waist. So I'm walking around, like, just, like, waving the flutter. But I don't even need this. Like, just walking around. And then she's, like, blows the whistle. She's, like, duh, you're done. See you next week. I'm, like, what do you mean I'm done? She's, like, you're done. See you next week. I'm, like, you got to be kidding me. This is, this is swimming lessons? Like, I was, like, I can, I can do that. That I can do. So the next week comes. I go back. It's Tuesday night again. She says, same as last week. Same as last week. Um, keep your life jacket on. Uh, shallow end. Here's the flutter board. You're good. If, you're, if you feel up for it, inch your way to the little bit deeper water. If you want, blows the whistle. You're done. See you next week. I'm like, what? I'm done a quarter of the lessons. Like, I'm done two-eighths of the lessons, right? So I'm like, you know, the third week, guess what happened? I wanted to go back. I wanted to go back. I already thought I could do it. You know, I was like, I could do that. And then I'm like telling people I'm doing it, like switch my shower routine. I'm showering at night now. I'm like, this is a whole different thing. I got a little restaurant near there that I like. This is cool. <laughs> at the end of the eight weeks, four hours total of swimming lessons, I could do it. I could do the front crawl. That summer, I swam around the island. It's like, how did that happen? How did that happen? Like. Like, I couldn't swim for my whole life. And then in four hours, I could swim. Not prettily, but, like, I could do it. Like, I could kind of do it. I could swim around the island. And, you know what, I kind of thought about it, and I realized that the way we grow up, the way we grow up is we all are taught to believe that motivation leads to action. But actually, what I learned then was that Action leads to motivation. Action leads to motivation. It happens exactly the opposite. It happens exactly the opposite. If you just do it, then you think you can do it, and then you want to do it. You guys are smart people. You know, I can tell by where you work. You know, I've talked to a lot of you. I'm impressed by you guys. You guys are, it's a great, this is a great company. And like, I'm, I live in my head sometimes a little too much. And let me put it a different way then. It's like, it is easier to act yourself into a new way of thinking than to think yourself into a new way of acting. Our brains are our own worst enemy. 
They're our own worst enemy. So it's like, how do you turn your biggest fear into your biggest success? You, you just do it. You, you really just do it. And then you plow through it because the, the confidence and the motivation follow. They follow. They follow. And, you know, don't just take it from me. Like, take it from Isaac Newton. Okay, the greatest physicist of all time. You may remember he discovered gravity, invented calculus, and built the first working telescope. Cool LinkedIn profile if he was alive. Um, but you know what he said in his first law of motion? Anyone remember this? It's like 10th grade science. He said, he said, an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by an equal or greater force. We always thought, people thought until then, like you needed force to create action. No, no, he's like, yeah, if, it, if it's going, it ain't gonna stop. You know, if, it, if it's going, it isn't gonna stop. You know what I did after Adult Learn to Swim was over? I signed up again for Adult Learn to Swim 1, like the same exact class I just took. I signed up four more times. That is totally true. I just liked it. It was part of my routine. I liked the fact that I was learning. I was so proud of it. You know what I mean? I bought a bathing suit, obviously. Like, obviously, you figure that out from the first class. And then, and then it's like, you know, it just keeps going. It just keeps going. It just keeps going. There's a reason that when an upcoming stand-up comedian named Brad Isaac asked Jerry Seinfeld backstage here in New York before the TV show got big, Seinfeld, he said, hey, Jerry, what's your trick for becoming such a great stand-up? What do you do to get better? How do you write better jokes? Jerry said, it's simple. All you got to do is put a giant wall calendar above your computer, and after you've procrastinated for three hours cleaning your apartment, if you sit down and write just one joke, I don't care if it's good or not, I don't care if it's good or not. Just write one, like for two seconds. Just write a simple thing. Then put a big red X on that day, on that calendar. The next day, you're going to want to continue that streak. So you sit down until you can do it again. And then soon, you're not going to want that streak to stop. So suddenly, you're writing every day. And the way to become a better stand-up comedian is to write every day. Trick your brain into putting action first and make it something that you have to break to get out. So... What do you do about that novel you want to write or the marathon you want to run? You don't need the perfect playlist and the perfect running shoes or the running buddy who's sick. You just need to run to the stop sign in your dress shoes. If you just do it, then you'll think you can do it. Then you'll want to do it. You'll start bringing some shoes to work. You'll start finding someone to go with. That comes later. That comes later. You know the novel you want to write? You don't need the perfect moleskin and the right coffee shop, the bright idea. You just need a pen. Literally a pen. And if you write down a few sentences the next day, you think, I got it started. Now I want to keep it going. Okay? Action leads to motivation, not the other way around. Those guys are just two of the things I wanted to share with you today. Um, I got lots more, but they weren't unfortunately able to accommodate my seven-hour keynote request. <laughs> So I've just kind of given you a couple. I've just kind of given you a couple. There's a ton more I'd like to talk about, and we will do so right now in the Q&A. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Neil. So we will move to Q&A. So as you have your questions, please come over to the mic. We have about 15 minutes left with the amazing Neil. So any question you have counts, and we'd love you to line up here, or if you're on the stream, you can go ahead and send in your questions that way. So I actually have my first question for you. I love the note that you ended on around doing and how doing will lead to that. That motivation leads to the doing. So I'm curious, Neil, what do you want to do next? What's something on your list to do? Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think a time this way, you know, it's like we all get 168 hours a week. You get that. I get that. Um, Barack Obama gets that. Oprah gets that. Uh, Everyone gets the same amount of time, you know? The richest man in the world can't buy more time. It's not for sale. So if you have 168 hours, the way I like to think about it is you got three buckets. You got three buckets of 56. 56, 56, and 56. It adds up nicely to 168. So if you like sleeping eight hours a night, which I do, but I don't because of the small children factor. But if you can get eight hours a night, you should. There's a lot of research that tells you why. And that's 56 hours perfectly, right? Like eight hours a night, seven days a week. I got one whole bucket of my time. It's just me sleeping, okay? Then you have another bucket because I know because I'm here today, it's called work, right? 
and I don't know how much you work. Everyone works different amounts. Everyone has different jobs. But like, let's just call it 56 because you have your job. You're probably checking emails at home. There's commuting, whatever. Like, I'm just going to call it a bucket. I know some people will be slightly more or less, but there's a whole bucket. There's a whole bucket of time. Well, here's the model I use in my life. My model is this. What's your third bucket? That could be the label of this picture. It's like these two buckets create, justify, and pay for your third fun bucket. Know what you're spending your time on and make sure it's something you love. For the last six years, my side hustle or side project was this stuff. I wrote a thousand awesome things.com, which is one essay every single day for four years on my blog, a thousand awesome things.com. Um, I didn't realize how big a thousand was till I was a month in. I'm like, I'm only on 960. There's a lot of time left. And then um, I wrote these books, the books of awesome. And then I've been speaking and talking about it. That was my whole third bucket. Like I, cause I was at Walmart the whole time. And that was my whole third bucket. And, but then this year with the, with the baby, you know, with the babies, we're like, now we're like, I can't do it. I personally want to be there for dinner and I want to give bath and I want to do the bedtime and I want to like put my son to bed every night. And so, um, I had to drop my full-time job so I could do this kind of stuff, which I love as my third bucket. It's something fun. It's something I enjoy. So what am I doing in that bucket to your question? Um, the biggest thing I'm about to, I'm excited about is next week, um, uh, a new speech I gave comes out. It's called, how do you maximize your tiny short life? It's not anything I've talked about today. Everyone's doing a TED talk. This is the first ever TED listen in the world, I think. So it's 10 minutes of me just asking questions. I'm very happy to send or share it with you if you would like. Uh, my email address is neil at globalhappiness.org. Um, or you can hit me on LinkedIn. Seriously, I will send it to you. It comes out on Monday and I'd love to share that with you. That's my new kind of project, uh, this big sort of macro 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 question idea really 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 big questions that we don't think about enough thanks neil thank so you now's the time for you guys to ask some questions neil has been kind enough if you don't want to walk all the way to the mic you can shout your question he yeah. will repeat it so the stream can hear so feel free to raise your hand or come on up there's no we'll such thing as a bad question so anything you're thinking about is great it could be anything i've talked about or anything i haven't yes how do you handle setbacks? It's a great question. And sometimes people say like, do you have setbacks? I'm like, yeah, lots. I mentioned, I kind of joked at the beginning. I'm like, there's tons of failures in there. I think the thing is, you know, if you ask a good photographer, how do you take such good pictures? You know what most of them say? I just take lots. That's what you, you've heard this before. It's like, I just take thousands. So that's why I always get 10 great ones because I take so many more. And like, I think it's like a table with legs on it. That's your life. If you have a table like this with one leg on it, and I know because I was here before and I knocked it over, it can fall over. It can fall over pretty easily. I call that one table. You can think of it in terms of it's up to you. Cash flow streams, if you want. Uh, relationships, if you want. Um, but for me, it's like, how many legs does your table have? So how do I handle setbacks? I try to have a multi-legged table at all times. Like I said, at Walmart, I was doing my blogs and my books. It made me more risk-taking in my writing to know I had a full-time job. It made me more risk-taking in meetings. I was mouthy and asking questions of the CEO because I'm like, yeah, fire me. I got this other thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's two legs on my table. Two legs right there. And then if I add a third thing, a passive income stream, or I'm doing something online, or I'm speaking now, whatever, it's multi-legged. How do I handle setbacks? I look at the other legs. I think about what else I got going on. Let that thing naturally come back. It's okay. Just be doing multiple things at once. To me, that's how I think about it. And it never makes a low feel super low because I'm not all in on anything. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, Noel said, if you can't hear the question because you're not in the microphone, I'm going to repeat it. So now I'm going to say your question. Like, I'm going to say it like you said. You said, you said, because <laughs> I guess, happiness didn't win the election. And so now what? Like, what about happiness in groups? We talked about individuals. Now what about others? What about the people in our families or the boss or the coworker that's kind of like, you know, a part of our team that, uh, you know, 
my boss doesn't like it when I go do one of these things in the middle of lunch. So like, what do I do about collective happiness? Here's the thing. There's two answers to this question. The first one is inoculation. Okay. The first answer is literally like, I want you to take, do it for you first. Like I, the, the better you are, the better dad you are, the better you are, the better teammate you are. You must take care of yourself first. It's so important. It's the reason why when the oxygen mask drops down in the airplane, they say, make sure you put it on yourself before you put it on your kid because an unconscious adult can't put it on anyone. You know what I mean? Think about that metaphor. It's like you got to take care of yourself. The second thing, I said there's two parts, is social signals. I really want you to remember that phrase. Social signals. Social signals. If you have a team of five people with a, a sort of a, a tough boss, you know, don't try to crack the boss. Don't try to aim for the hardest nut to crack. Instead, look for low-hanging fruit. You want to go on a 20-minute walk at lunch through Central Park? Who of the five might be most likely to go with you? Is there a person that has running shoes collecting dust in the corner of their office? You know, who's the person most likely to come? If you get two, it's easier than, by the first follower principle, Great TED Talk by Derek Sivers, if you haven't seen it. First follower. It's easier to get a third, you know? If you get that first one, it's easier to get a third. If you have three, suddenly you're tipping. And if the boss has a team of people going out for a walk at lunch, the boss is going to come. You've just tipped them over with social signals, which are, me which are measured based on the frequency and the depth and the sort of nature of the relationship around the person. So, and I answered it that way because I often, it's related to your question, but I often get like, what about my mom? I'm never going to, like, it's my mom, but she's never happy. Or it's, what about my, you know, the family member or whatever. The, in those situations, I try to give the social signal advice after you kind of take care of your own happiness first. I can't solve all the problems. Come on. If you got like macro things, it's like, I told you I'm from Canada. We have a very lax immigration policy. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> We have time for about two more questions. Who wants to take it? Yeah. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Mm. -hmm. Right, okay, so the question is about the subtitle to the happiness equation. But these are great questions, by the way, and then none of them were planned. It's not even the first one. Like, literally, I didn't know it was coming. So he's like, what about the subtitle of the book? It's like, want nothing. What? Plus, do anything equals have everything. Explain your subtitle. Well, here's the thing. I said there's nine secrets in the book, right? So want nothing is the first three, okay? Be happy first, do it for you, and remember the lottery. Do anything is about, and that's about contentment contentment is the underlying message there. Being happy with what you have, the secret to knowing you have enough is realizing, like, I already kind of got it, you know what I mean? That's wanting nothing, lowering your desire and increasing your contentment. Doing anything is about freedom, okay? Creating space, never retiring, like, uh, overvaluing yourself. And finally, we have have everything, which is ultimately the de end goal, that's the destination, that's happiness. And I, I don't want to kind of, I don't want to go deep into all those three because, like they couldn't give me a seven hour slot, but you have all the, you all have the book. It's in there. So here's the thing. Want nothing is ultimately, I said about being happy first, doing it for you and remembering the lottery. Some of you, when I said that were like, what do you mean? What does remembering the lottery mean? Remembering the lottery, and it's related to your question too, means remembering that you already won. If you have a bad day or you have a stressful moment or you aren't happy with the results of anything that something just happened, whatever, just Try to remember the lottery. It's related to want nothing. How? Here's how. There are 105 billion people who have ever lived, ever, total, like your grandparents, their grandparents, their grandparents, their grandparents, 105 billion people total. You are one of the 7 billion alive today, right? So that is a 1 in 15 lottery. You already won the being alive lottery, which means that 14 out of every 15 people will never see another sunset, have a bowl of chocolate ice cream, or kiss their kids goodnight, ever again. You already won the lottery. 
of the 7 billion people alive on earth today, you're one of 300 million here, okay? Why did I say here? Because that's another one in 20 lottery. It's another one in 20 lottery. The United States and Canada are at the top of the United Nations World Happiness Report every year, together with our Scandinavian brothers and sisters. If anyone here is Finnish or Norwegian, you're like double happy. Um, why? Because if you read the 100-page PDF they pull out, they put out, and like I did, and you know, it's a long read, but here's the, here's the actual metrics. Do you trust the water that comes out of your tap? Do you feel safe when you walk out your front door? Can you marry who you like and be and live wherever you want? These collective sets of freedoms enable happiness. If, you are, if those aren't enough lotteries for you to win, I'll paint you a couple more. Only one in two people around the world has internet access. Only one in two people around the world has a job. You guys have both, right? Um, only 7% of the world has any post-secondary education total. 93% of people don't get the opportunities you've had. And I could keep going, and in the book I keep going, but the point is, remember, it's like the Louis C.K. clip, uh, you know, every, everything's, every, there's so much to be thankful for, but it's hard to be happy, and the way I use that is to say, remember the lottery, and let's always try to remember that we've already won. I feel like I won the lottery being here today. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day, everybody, around the world. All righty, let's do give Neil one more amazing round of applause. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you. I'm sure you guys are just as inspired, as informed as I am, and thank you for being vulnerable, sharing about swimming trunks and such and beyond. So we're so excited to have you, Neil. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for everyone for joining. If you want a photo with Neil, we have a professional photographer here, or of course, if you'd like him to sign your new copy of The Happiness Equation, meet us right out here. Again, feel free to share this on all forms of social media. The replay will be up on speakers.linkedin.com. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Neil, and have a great week, everyone. Gigantic thank you to this amazing woman, Noelle. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thank, you. thank you. Have a good one, everybody.